So yes, yeah, so just a little bit about MSSC and, and who we are. So we're the nation's leading certifying body uh, to help prepare people uh, to enter into career pathways in manufacturing and supply chain logistics. Uh, but we also have higher level certifications to prepare people more at the technical repair level or the automation level like we've heard about today. And again, I would just like to express my great gratitude and thanks to, to Steve Harrington and the team over at the National Center for Supply Chain Automation, uh, Paul Perkins and his team at Amatrol, of course, Phil Jones and his team with Target, and of course, all the other amazing uh, employers like Honeywell and others that pro provided us with subject matter experts to really develop uh, the certification that we're talking about today or three certifications, just to be clear. So just generally on MSSC, we're an industry-led nonprofit. We have over 2,900 uh, trained instructors that deliver our training and courseware to our certificants. Uh, we have close to 1,900 or 1,860 assessment centers in all 50 states. We're the only national certifying body for manufacturing and logistics that has reached the highest level of accreditation. So. We have been accredited under ISO standard 17024. And as a lot, of, a lot of you know, if you've been through these ISO 9000 or ISO standards, they're really quite rigorous. And for, for both our manufacturing and certification systems for logistics, uh, we've met the highest uh, international standard for certifying personnel companies. Uh, we're also endorsed by the National Association of Manufacturers. And just briefly, we now have a total of seven certifications. Oh, we have two as two to prepare people to be production technicians, CP, our CPT program. We have our similar certified logistics technician. So we have five certifications now that relate directly to um, supply chain facilities like distribution centers and fulfillment centers and warehousing operations where you know e-commerce has just been exploding. So uh, we have five for e-commerce related distribution centers, the certified logistics technician, the certified forklift technician for service repair and maintenance of forklift trucks. And then we have the three today that I'm so excited to present on. Um, and again, a fabulous partnership with M MSSC, NCSA, NCSCA, Amatrol, and also MHI and Mahita, Material Handling Industries and the Material Handling Equipment Distributors Association. So great partnerships were involved. Um, again, the CTSCA is a person who installs, operates, supports, upgrades, or maintains the automated material handling equipment and systems that support the supply chain. Like all of our certification programs, uh, we start with industry-defined validated standards by subject matter experts. So who are the people that are doing this work on a daily basis? Those, who we, those are the people from industry that we choose, as we should, to be your standard-setting body. Those standards are then used to develop assessments, courseware, instructor training, and of course, our assessments to give offer, offer credentials. And under our ISO uh, requirement, we maintain a national registry of our certificates. So Paul Perkins touched on the three certifications. Uh, the first kind of entry point would be equipment maintenance. And you'll see here a list of kind of the main uh, topic areas and skill set areas that are, that are covered as part of the equipment maintenance program. And these are difficult. So, you know, we've had ACT, American College of Testing has a work keys program that's part of their national career readiness certificate program that uh, where they've done a leveling, an academic leveling of the CTSCA and really maybe juniors, but definitely seniors in high school. So it's a, the gold standard for math in English really is, this is quite math intensive. It's not, you don't need to know trigonometry. Uh, you don't need to know calculus, but it's still, there is a pretty strong mathematical component to all three of these certifications. So that's a, a factor in terms of preparing your certificates for success so that they are at the right academic level. So the second is equipment repair. And you can see the list here of the main skills, skills that are covered. Troubleshooting, of course, for electrical, pneumatics, hydraulics, mechanical. And these are, again, of all the research done, these are the skill sets these employers, uh, that they, they, these are the, the skills that these employers are asking for. And I think you've seen the list of very impressive employers that have been involved in this, this, this level. So finally, the capstone here is the CTSCA uh, network repair. So this is so exciting because 
you know, everything, as you know, in these advanced environments these days are driven by computerized systems and software systems. And of course, you have the, both the wired and all the wireless networks that run all these systems. So people have to understand, understand network repair. And so if you look at all three of these skill sets, it's not a surprise that uh, you're looking at, at um, starting salaries upwards of to just, just to at an entry point of all, if you have all three, probably at 35 to $40 an hour just to start. Um, so just what's what's involved in earning each certification. So really from the pro from the project work that we've seen so far in terms of the early training for equipment maintenance and all three of these, we're looking at probably at least 200 hours. This says 150 to 200 hours. What we're learning is it's probably closer to 200 hours. That depends, of course, on the skill level and the knowledge set of the certificate or candidate. Um, again, three certifications, three courses. Each course combines an e-learning component and also the hands-on uh, project-based component. And if, if you, you've seen, read some of these studies, if you learned from the studies about project-based learning, it's really the strongest way to learn. And, and I think that if having, hearing the testimonials from the target team, uh, there's no question that that ability to go through the theoretical and also the applied through these simulation e-learning uh, platforms and, and courseware the student then can take a break and then go on to the, the Skill Boss logistics device, this amazing sorting system that Amatrol has created. And then of course we have for the e-learning a multiple choice assessment. And then for the hands-on, a performance-based assessment where the instructor will actually observe that that candidate or certificate has those hands-on skills that they need. And so these are true for, for all three of these certifications. And if an individual must earn both the multiple choice and must learn the hands-on and earn the performance-based and the multiple choice assessments and pass and meet the cut score. Um, again, one advantage to the Skill Boss logistics device is that it sits on a tabletop and everything's incorporated in this table a system where you have both a controller or a PLC or computer running this Skill Boss device, and it's it's it again combines the best of all practices. But if you look at cost, if you look at all the technology that Amatrol has put in to the development and the the training that's offered through both the e-learning and the Skill Boss logistics device, to try and replicate that through a hands-on training program, you'd probably need to buy maybe ten or so plus hands-on trainers. And they're not going to be a, a neat warehousing sorting system like the Skill Boss Logistics device. So all set, all built into one system, this whole training system could be offered in a computer lab at a high school. This could be offered in a science lab at a high school. This could of course be offered in just a computer classroom. And of course you need the tabletop Skill Boss Logistics device in the classroom, but like the target images of their training center, we're not talking about millions and millions of dollars. Many of these really advanced training centers are, are 10, 10, 10, 10, 12, 15 million dollars. So the savings are enormous. And it also provides a very strong platform to reach out to what we call equity populations or rural and urban populations that might not otherwise have an opportunity to go into this career path. But let me stop there and thank you so much. If you'd like to reach me, my name again is Neil Reddy and I can be reached at readyn at mssusa.org. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Neil, for that presentation. And also, again, sincere appreciation for your support of this symposium and for the center as a whole. Thank you. All right, so our next session is entitled Developing a Supply Chain Automation Program from Concept to Creation. Our presenters are Dr. James McDonald, who is the Professor and Dean of Career and Technical Programs at Valencia College and Professor Kevin Curley, Program Chair for Engineering Technology, AS Degree Program at Valencia College, Osceola. Uh, please remember, post your questions in the chat window, just the chat window, and select panelists and attendees in the two menu, so we all see them. Um, we have set aside some time for Q&A at the end. Dr. McDonald will get us started. Welcome, James. Hello, how are you doing? So um, just let me, can y'all see my screen? I'm sorry. Yes. You can? Okay. Looks good. All right, thank you. All right, um, 
So good afternoon. So you know, before I get started um, in my presentation, I do want to you start by thanking the National Center um, for giving us the opportunity to share our experience and building this supply chain automation program. I also want to acknowledge, um, I'm sorry, I also want to acknowledge the, um, the support we've received from the National Science Foundation and the ATE grant. Um, without it, um, this work could not have been done. And next, I want to um, recognize the two ATE centers of excellence that supported this work. Flake and the National Center for Supply Chain Automation. They have provided wonderful and needed support. We are very grateful to uh, Marilyn Barger from Flate and Colleen Mako um, and Steve Harrington and Valerie Piper from the National Center for Supply Chain Automation. I also want to recognize our industry partners. Uh, they've been critical for our success of the program and uh, you'll hear more about them and their involvement in the development of this program too. And I also want to give a shout out to um, Bill Jones from Target, because um, even though uh, Target's not a part of our advisory board and, and didn't take part in the, the DACM, he was um, very gracious in giving us a letter of support for, um, for the development of our program. And that was critical to get the um, approval from the state of Florida. So thanks, Bill. So um, now for the reasons we're here. The development of our supply chain automation program at Valencia College involved three stages. The first was the exploration stage. I have to admit prior to starting on this journey to develop a supply chain automation program, I had no idea about the field. Um, it's fair to say that I started the trip without knowing the destination. Next, after receiving approval to create the program, the next phase kicked into gear, which was a development process. What's important to note here is that the supply chain automation program is actually being developed as a specialization in the engineering and technology AS degree. That was the degree Valencia College did not offer. So I'm sure you're no doubt familiar with the expression about putting the cart before the horse. Well, we actually didn't have a horse, so we had to start there, which was a development of an engineering technology degree. Once that was accomplished, we were able to add a supply chain automation specialization. All that was left then was to teach the courses. Simple enough, right? Well, Kevin will share with you his experiences with implementing the program, as well as the growing pains we encountered along the way. So the exploration process. Back in 2016, I was asked by uh, my campus president, Dr. Catherine Plinsky, um, to explore what it would take to offer an engineering program at the Osceola campus, which for those of you unfamiliar with or familiar with Central Florida, that's in Kissimmee, Florida, near Disney World. We already had an electronics engineering AS degree on our West Campus, but Dr. Polinsky wanted to see about adding an engineering focus program at the Osceola campus. When I was given that task, I didn't know anything about engineering programs or specifically about the engineering technology AS degree. So the first person I visited was our Assistant Vice President of Career and Workforce Education, Dr. Nasser Padai. Nasser was the former Dean over the electronics engineering technology AS degree and was familiar with the ET degree and flight. Nasser suggested I speak with Marilyn Barger, um, who was the director of Flight, which I did in March of 2017. And at that meeting, Marilyn told me about the statewide engineering forum that meets biannually. She suggested that attending the next forum would be a good way for me to meet ET faculty from across the state, as well as vendors and our program officer for the state of Florida. And shortly after that forum, I also learned about the ATE High Impact Conference that was going to be held in Salt Lake City, Utah that same year. So along with one of our grant writers, I attended that conference in search of knowledge and ideas, and I'm happy to report that I discovered both. At that conference, I attended a presentation by Colleen Malko about the National Center for Supply Chain Automation at Northwood College. Colleen spoke about the supply chain automation model program they developed um, and the process they used and the industry partners who supported that work. And it was at that moment when I decided to pursue an NSF AT grant um, to develop a supply chain automation program. So I had my cart, I just, again, needed my horse. So what about that horse? Well, as we were writing our grant application, the question about whether the college would add an engineering technology program had to be answered. Unfortunately, the college leadership approved it both. And several months later, we received word that our NSF AT grant was approved and the development work would start. And our grant period started July 1st of 2018 and ends um, June 30th of this year. 
So before moving on to the development piece, I wanna end this part by saying that the exploration phase was not just about learning about the EP program or the supply chain automation commissions programs. It was most importantly about building connections to people and organizations. It was during this time that we also developed connections with Walmart, Target, Family Dollar, UPS, FedEx, just to name a few. And I developed those connections by attending conferences such as those put on by ProMAT, um, MHI, the National Center for Supply Chain Automation. And at those conferences not only helped me better understand the industry, but connected me to industry representatives who would later serve on our advisory board, participate in our curriculum development process, and support our program in a number of very impactful ways. So I can't say enough about that part of the exploration phase. So I'm not gonna go deep into the curriculum development of our engineering technology degree, except to say that we were able to leverage some funds from a Title V grant, to develop that program. And most importantly, we had a little luck on our side too. So now that the ET program was approved in February of 2020, after that we were able to hire Kevin um, the week before spring break in March of 2020, which I will add was the week before the pandemic hit uh, and the college froze all new hiring and the nation pretty much went into lockdown. So it goes without saying, and I'll say it anyways, we got very lucky with our timing. And in fact, um, uh, Kevin was actually able to attend this conference last year in Atlanta, um, which is the reason why I wanted to bring him on early. So, um, so we were able to get you know Kevin on board and uh, give him the time he needed in order to launch the program um, later in 2020. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the NSF AT grant was uh, for a three-year period um, starting July 1st of 2018. So our plan was to develop the curriculum and get the state approval for the program in years one and two of the grant. In year three, uh, we received approval from the College Curriculum Committee. Um, the program will officially launch in August of 2021, and the figure on this slide describes the steps in the development process and the timeline for the development of the program. Step one in the process was to conduct a DACOM. Now, even though the National Center had already conducted um, a DACOM as part of the development of their model program, we felt it was important to conduct our own DACOM. This allowed us to engage um, our local industry partners in the process as well as validate the National Center's results. Essentially, um, I can say that our DACOM, we ended up with similar results in terms of the program and um, the courses that we were gonna offer. Um, still, the DACOM process um, was good for us. It was a good first step and it allowed us to hear directly from our local partners on what they felt was important in the supply chain automation technician program. And I wanna add, yesterday I sat through um, Ned Young's presentation. I know that the, um, the new model curriculum has, has evolved um, and now incorporates more uh, network repair and cybersecurity. And I, I know that Kevin is looking at incorporating that in our program as well. Um, so the program that he's gonna share with you will actually evolve and maybe a bit differently next year as a result. Um, so a key deliverable for the grant was the development of the curriculum. Um, the supply chain automation specialization did not exist in the state frameworks under the ET degree in Florida. So our next step was to develop the frameworks for the specialization and submit a justification for the new program the State Department of Education, and that's where our, um, our industry partners play a key role. The justification had to be based on labor market needs as well as industry support. Several of our DACON participants provided letters, uh, and before, however, I would say before submitting our request to the state, we also presented the frameworks to the ET forum. Um, we did this um, both live and through, through email, um, and it was a key step because when we did the presentation, um, I remember doing it personally in Sarasota at one of the EP forums, our program officer from the state was there. And what was good about his presence being there was he saw the collaborative nature of the development of this program, which I think eventually um, helped with the um, development of the program. So next I wanna just talk real quickly about um, pathways. Um, as we developed the program too, we had pathways in mind, you know, where are our students coming from, you know, who are our students going to be. We, we figure they will have a mixture of um, non-traditional students, people coming from the workforce, you know, getting reskilled, retrained, so, along with um, sort of traditional students coming from the high school. So we worked with our high schools to develop a career pathway model for students that are in their advanced manufacturing programs to articulate credit into, you know, our engineering technology program. And we also thought about you know, where are our students going to go when they graduate? Our intent is they'll go to work, but we know that sometimes in life people want to come back to college and where would they 
matriculate to uh, or transfer to and matriculate uh, for, as a, at the baccalaureate level. So we thought about that too. So um, that's pretty much it for my portion of the presentation. You know, Kevin will be next and he'll share his experiences with actually um, developing the courses and teaching the courses and how that experience is about. So I'm going to stop sharing so Kevin can share. Thank you, James. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I wanted to um, just leverage off of what James said. Uh, some days I feel like a horse and some days I feel like a cart. There has never been a day where I felt like I'm the person with the whip driving this thing. <laughs> but um, I have a chart here where I just point out just a couple milestones. I was hired in the spring of 2020, as James mentioned. Uh, charged to launch the, the horse, which is the ET program in fall 2020. And then also to launch the supply chain automation program a year later this fall. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, from my perspective, it was like, okay, I'm hired. It sounds kind of easy. All I have to do is spit out a few courses and we're off to the races. But that's easy to say, but it's a really a whole lot of work to get there. And I'm, I'm still working on some core courses and I'll tell you more about that in just a little bit. I'm not quite a one man band. I do have a couple of adjunct professors that help me out. I have one who covers my uh, technical math and um, um, I have one that covers uh, engineering graphics along with me because that's a very popular area and we always have many sessions of it. Uh, so I have a few bullets on the right here. I'm gonna talk a bit about my year one and uh, about building the courses, and then uh, a little bit about our, our equipment and facilities. And in each of those, I'll talk about some of the challenges I had in those particular areas. But then I'm gonna wrap up with some of the, uh, the key challenges that I face uh, moving forward. I'm sorry, I have a little technical difficulty here. So year one, as James mentioned, I was hired in the spring. Um, I had a, a couple of weeks on campus where I, I met a few people. I got the tour, HR, my paperwork, all that sort of thing. And then I went off to Atlanta with James for the spring 2020 symposium. And while we were there, we were contacted by the college and they said, that, don't come back to campus, go home and self-isolate for two for a few weeks. And that was a, a bit of a surprise. It was certainly a unique entry in the academia. And uh, it really didn't matter because when we got back, it was spring break and the campus had decided that uh, like most of the, uh, the country, we were gonna be shut down with, and not returning to campus after the spring break. So all coursework, um, in, in rapid fashion went online. And for me, it wasn't a big deal because I wasn't really teaching at the time, but it did mean everything that I was going to be preparing for the fall had to uh, look at it from an online perspective. Uh, I started to look at the courses to develop them. And um, it was a bit of an eye opener for me because while in discussions, I was understanding we had course outlines and that sort of thing, uh, what we really didn't have was the courses that go along with those outlines. And there's a big difference between an outline and the actual course. So I, I really, at that time, started to begin to uh, realize what amount of work was ahead of me. Um, one of the other things I want to mention during that uh, early first few weeks, I was fortunate enough to have met a couple of the, uh, the key uh, equipment providers. Um, I want to mention Rod Yeager from Amatrol, Steve Sircone from Festo. Uh, meeting those guys and hearing about their equipment and understanding who they were and the fact that they get around uh, not just the state of Florida, but the, the country as a whole, they kind of know what's going on at various schools, who's using what, what programs they have. And, and I found that they're a great resource to, to reach out and talk to uh, from time to time. I also met the, the um, industry partners that James mentioned. Um, one of them, uh, I was almost uh, able to go work in the Amazon distribution center last summer. 
uh, to sort of uh, fill the roles of a supply chain technician for a little while, just to understand what the job entails from a, a boots on the ground kind of perspective. And unfortunately, COVID uh, squashed that idea. And um, I'm really hoping that might come around again because I, I really want to have that opportunity. I think it'll benefit me a great deal and the, the influence it'll allow me to have on the students would, would be uh, uh, improved. And then the, the organizations, uh, FLATE and NCSEA, uh, being at that symposium was a, a great indoctrination and, and I met a handful of people and, and uh, got, got a good feel for what this whole thing was about um, right from the start. Uh, so here I am in new to academia. I have never taught before. I'm 40 years out of an engineering career in industry. Um, I'm not entirely new to teaching. I've had some opportunity in my industry career to do, do a little bit of uh, teaching and mentoring. So it wasn't a big stretch to, to feel like I could go and, and teach some, some young minds. Um, and I was uh, fortunate in that I was able to um, plan my uh, Fundamentals of Electronics Lab as a face-to-face -face lab on the campus. So that was a great benefit to me because I didn't have to wait until this year uh, before I actually uh, saw some students. And seeing the students and interacting with them is a, a great benefit to me. Uh, it's just not the same online. I'm sure uh, everybody knows that and the students will tell you that too. But um, I've been, been able to teach that lab face-to-face -face in, in the fall, last fall, and in this spring, we just were completing this week with finals. And, and again, in the summer, I have two classes that are gonna be face-to-face uh, -face labs. And in the fall, I'm gonna have even more. So I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go. Um, Valencia as a whole, I gotta say, has a great supportive uh, environment. Um, Everybody here has been really helpful. We have a good uh, teaching and learning academy staff that helped me quickly get up to speed on how to build online courses. And uh, I feel like uh, over the past year, I've become uh, quite an expert in Canvas and how that works. And, and I don't have any problem with that now. Um, so let's take a look. So this shows the program and uh, I color coded this to sort of talk about the course building. I don't show the gen ed courses, but what I show is we have these core foundation courses and then we have some electives that are common. And then we have our two specializations, the advanced manufacturing and supply chain automation. Green courses, I have two of those that these were existing courses at the college that I was hoping that we'd just be able to uh, bring them over and use them and just reformat them for me. And, that, and that's basically what we were able to do there. Um, the blue courses, uh, these are courses that I built and uh, they've all been online until now and we're, we're teaching them. Uh, a couple of them are gonna be in the summer, but they're all online except for the fundamentals of electronics, which has had that face-to-face -face lab. Uh, I am going to have a face-to-face -face lab in the summer on manufacturing uh, materials and processes as well. So there'll be two face-to-face -face labs during the summer. Uh, the orange courses. Now, these are courses that exist in our college, um, but they're part of the, the BSET degree over at our West Campus. So initially it was thought maybe I could use those, but turns out there's some uh, specifics about those that are particular for that program, uh, one of them being prerequisites that uh, won't really work for me. So I'm gonna have to build um, a version of these, if you will, for the AS degree program. And, and I started doing that now, looking at the, uh, the PLC course. I have uh, something that I outlined and it's in the approval cycle now, um, hoping to teach that in the fall. And then the black, everything that's in black text is a course that I still need to build. And I, I haven't had a chance to look at those yet. And I'm, the way I'm operating is when it's uh, being targeted for the next semester, then I can get serious and, and knock out the course and be prepared to teach it. Uh, so some numbers here, if you were to, to uh, look at the st statistics, I built eight courses and I have 14 more to go. So uh, the program phasing. So let's take a look at the, the course phasing 
in terms of what we're offering when. This shows the, uh, the semesters from last fall till now and leading into this fall. And you can see what we did. We started out with some of the core courses at last fall and uh, those have, three of them have pushed through. We're probably gonna teach those every semester, the three at the top. Uh, we introduced our uh, industrial safety and intro to quality assurance in the spring. And those are online courses. Uh, they may continue on as well, as long as we can have the enrollment for them. Um, I have a couple courses that are uh, starting for the first time in the summer, uh, manufacturing materials and processes and the concepts of lean with Six Sigma. And then uh, in the fall, you can see I have a lot of red here. This is what I'm hoping to do. And uh, a lot of this will depend on my adjunct support because I, I, I can't do this all myself. Um, and uh, I will say now I am <laughs> looking for additional help. So if you know anybody who lives in the Central Florida area, uh, the Osceola campus is beautiful. We have some great uh, equipment and facilities I'm going to show you, and I'd be real interested in talking to them. So let's take a look at the equipment and facilities. Uh, equipment first. You can see on the left side here, that's quite a list of equipment. Um, I have no complaints at all for the, uh, the resources that have been made available to, available to me to teach this uh, program. Uh, we have more equipment than space. In fact, uh, space is one of my problems and challenges uh, going forward. And uh, we've been working on some of that and, and have uh, addressed a little bit of it, but it's gonna continue to grow a little bit because I still have some equipment that's uh, yet to be delivered and should be showing up uh, sometime in early summer. Um, the building itself is called the uh, Careers in Industry and Technology or CIT building. And you can see it here in the picture on the right. It's really a, a beautiful facility and it's almost as new as I am. I, I think it opened a year before I was hired, but it's a, a really a, 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 a top-notch um, facility with some state-of-the-art uh, teaching tools. And it's, it's a pleasure to work in that building. Looking at the inside uh, on the left here, this is a picture of uh, my lab. It's a fairly large lab and it's, a, it's an all-purpose lab. And um, I'm gonna uh, operate it in a reconfigurable mode where we roll in and out the equipment we need down in the back area here and uh, teach the classes. And, and um, this front section here, we have these great lab benches, uh, two tiered benches that are really uh, equivalent to something that a, a student might see out in the working world if he was to go off and work at an aerospace uh, manufacturing area or, or maybe a small company manufacturing area. Uh, it's very uh, like what they're gonna see in that kind of environment. Um, off here on the right is a picture of our Skill Boss Logistics that was delivered uh, back a few months ago. And uh, this is a great tool and I can't wait to start using it more. I have already had opportunity to work it into my Fundamentals of Electronics course. Uh, the week after uh, it was received, uh, I was covering uh, sensors and I was able to use this to demonstrate and show uh, three different types of uh, optical sensors in operation. So it, it really had a, a good impact. And I know the students were a little bit excited to see that thing working because it does show you um, a little bit of everything that might be going on in a, in a distribution center. Uh, I got a couple more pictures here. This one on the left is a picture of one of my students' projects from the spring. Uh, we just finished that uh, just a week ago. And our, our project was to build a, a design and build an edge built an edge lit uh, LED lamp. And I'm happy to say that uh, we had 100% success rate. Every student was able to build the project, solder it up, assemble the whole thing and show it operating. So I was really pleased with that. And I know the students were, were really excited about that project. It was something that we weaved into the curriculum all year long. And in the end, they got to build it and see it work and take it home. So that was kind of cool. On the right as uh, one of the, the two robots that we have in our program. Um, this one, and we have a SCARA robot, and the, the goal is to integrate one of those with our skill boss logistics and, um, and have that be a, a part of the, the projects that we might work into to some of the PLC programming. But I do definitely look forward to using that more. So challenges going forward. Um, the challenges going forward really are, are um, 
the course uh, building. I have a lot of courses to build. Um, and I look forward to shifting more of those on campus. Um, the second challenge is, goes along with that is our course offering. How do we phase these courses in and what do we offer, offer when? And unfortunately, a lot of that is gonna depend on, on um, more resources that I get in terms of being able to teach them. Uh, we're a little limited right now, but we have a good staff uh, keeping going what we have. And students' expectation coming in their program is that it's a two-year program. And uh, we need to find a way eventually that we're phasing these courses that allow a student to come in and move through the program in two years and graduate as expected. And, and the, uh, the campus opening that's occurring for us in the fall is going to help a great deal with that. And uh, it's going to get even better in, in the future semesters. Space. I mentioned space is my... Uh, one of my biggest problems right now, it's a great problem to have because I got a lot of great resources, as I mentioned. And um, my goal is to really operate in that reconfigurable mode as long as I can find a place to, to put the equipment we're not using when we're not using it. And uh, I'll be working with the campus personnel to figure that out as time goes on. There's more of us here on campus. Uh, the equipment itself. Initially, I was a little concerned because, as you all know, you can only teach a hands-on skill if you have the equipment to do it. Uh, I don't have that problem anymore. So I, I think I have all the equipment I need, or at least enough equipment where uh, I can figure out how to repurpose something for more than one reason. And, and I'm definitely uh, going to work towards doing that. One of the other challenges I believe I have is uh, coming from industry, um, I really am a big fan of applications oriented teaching and I wanna influence uh, my teaching with as much real world examples as I can. And uh, I'm not from uh, the automation industry. So I'm hoping that I can uh, work with some others and find some real examples that can influence my teaching. And then industry certs. Industry certs is something we've heard about uh, today and and it's a, it's a big thing in, in these uh, engineering technology area. And there are a lot of them, and I'm gonna be looking at the options there, uh, certainly a, as a, a intent to work those into the program. So students not only graduate with a degree, but also have some uh, certification credentials under their belt when they go out and, and find themselves a job. So that concludes my portion of the, the briefing. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to James and he's gonna to talk to you about some of our lessons learned and promising practices. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So um, I mentioned this earlier about developing industry connections. I personally found that to be so uh, important. I always realized how important that is whenever we're developing a new, new um, CT program, but it was particularly relevant, I think, for this program in particular. Um, since it was new to the college, the engineering technology program was new to the college, particularly supply chain automation specialization was new, not just to the college, but to the state of Florida. Um, also, when we're developing the program, clearly we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We recognized uh, the work that the National Center did creating their model program, so we certainly used and borrowed generously from what, from what they did. Um, but I, I did appreciate the value, like I mentioned earlier, in doing our own bacon, and it's something that I would certainly recommend in the future. Um, and I just lost the uh, PowerPoint presentation. But one of the things I want to end with is just by talking about the value of hiring your faculty member particularly if it's a new program, as early as you can. You know, we did that with Kevin. Like I said, we got lucky with the timing on that. But um, it was extremely um, important, not just for him, but, you know, he needed he needed that, that long runway, right? Um, and, and he needed time to get acclimated to the college. Um, you know, with COVID, we had to develop everything to be delivered on, online. Like he said, he, he, he doesn't come with a teaching background. Teaching online is new to him as well. And so there are a lot of issues going on. So he, he needed that time um, to prepare to, to successfully launch the program. Um, and you can see some of the other promising practices there. I don't wanna go you know, um, any longer. I, I'd also like to give um, you guys some time to ask any questions um, that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we did have a kind of a question, which of course comes often when we start thinking about these things. And that would be, if you were to develop this program again, what would you have done differently? Ah, 
That's a good question. Um, I think I probably would have maybe thought longer about how to capitalize on some resources to go to college. We offer an electronics engineering program and that program actually has been around for a long time. And when the state of Florida developed this engineering technology degree, Valencia didn't jump on it. Pretty much all the other state colleges did. Um, and so over the years, our EET faculty started adding courses that would ordinarily be in the ET program, like hydraulics and pneumatics, for instance. And um, so there was a lot of content already there um, and a lot of resources already there that um, we tried to use some of it, but some of it didn't align necessarily with what we needed to do. Um, but I think just better coordination with that early on probably would have been a, you know, a, a smart move. And then I guess this sort of um, kind of it's 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 a it's a question again for James, but Kevin, maybe you can address this as well. Um, did you have any challenges finding faculty qualified to uh, to teach the program? Well, I found Kevin. I'm very grateful that I found him. Um, <laughs> so, but as far as like finding adjunct faculty, um, that's a little bit more of a struggle. One of the issues we run into, obviously, with credentialing the credential. The, the uh, academic credentials someone needs to have to teach in the program is a master's degree in engineering. Okay? However, we know that a lot of the folks who actually work in the industry don't necessarily have a master's degree, right? So there is a process for us to alternatively credential them. But still finding people out there who, who, who are in industry who have time to come and teach, that's really a challenge for us. And Kevin, what, what, what can you add there? Well, I, I would agree. Uh not coming from uh, the automation industry. Um, it's a little tough for me to, to find adjunct uh, professors that would have the right skills to come in and, and teach the, the classes for me. I do have some contacts in manufacturing from my, my career and I've been reaching out to some of those, but so far I have not had success. Uh, so again, a, a self-serving pitch here. If anybody wants to uh, teach in Central Florida, it's beautiful here. I'll be happy to talk to you. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, kind of ask an associated question because I know that you uh, one of the first things you had on your thing on your list is getting industry involved. Any tips on how you were able to engage industry, how you're keeping industry engaged outside of hiring faculty uh, for some other some other things? You got any tips to share? Yeah, get to know Steve Harrington. That's the tip. <laughs> it's not there actually, but I'll, I'll just go on and um, say that really going to industry um, association trade shows is important um, because you know not only you know you know, like like the like the targets and the WalMarts and you know those organizations are great too, but the vendors too are also a great resource um, as Kevin alluded to earlier. And just other conferences, you know, the high tech conference, you know, the uh, this conference, right, this symposium is a great resource as well. I believe it was at this conference when it was held in Boca Raton several years ago that I met Phil Jones um, and Keith Nye from from Walmart. Um, I attended one of their one of their sessions, and I you know I, re I reached out to them after after the session, you know, got their name and number, and uh, and so that that was that was incredible. And so once you meet one person, sometimes that leads to meeting a second person or a third person. So um, the conferences, I think, are a real important. Yeah, I, I think I would add to that. Um, it is certainly a lot of resources available for these technology areas. And um, I look forward to when we're all back to campus everywhere. And uh, when we get together at these conf conferences, we can, we can talk and, and learn what each of us are doing. I will throw out a, an invite if anybody is in the Central Florida area and wants to stop by the campus, and see our facility and talk about what I'm doing. And I'd love to hear about what you're doing. Uh, you have an invite from me, so you'd be welcome. 